Hello friends and welcome back to another reading vlog. Today we are opening up my third month of the Wild Book Box, having a look at the three books that I've been sent and what we're going to be reading together over the next month. Very quickly, for those of you who haven't been following along so far, the Wild Book Box is a subscription service here in Australia where you basically kind of tell them a bunch of stuff that you like to read, that you want to read, and they send you some secondhand books every month. I went into this really kind of hoping to just explore books that I wouldn't necessarily pick out for myself and I especially emphasised that I'm interested in reading more Australian fiction but that I'm really open to being surprised as well. However, I think I might know one of the books that are in here because the Wild Book Box do post on their Instagram when they kind of do a big haul of secondhand books and if you see something you really want you can request it for your next box. And I did do that with a book so I think I know what one of them are but the others will be a surprise. So let's dive right in. As always it is beautifully packaged and we even have a new bookmark which says I'd rather be reading. I do love how each of our books is individually wrapped. It feels like a box full of presents. Let's have a look at our first one. The Eye of the Sheep by Sophie Laguna. I've never heard of this book before, although the name sort of sounds va vaguely familiar. And it is a win winner of the Miles Franklin Award 2015, so I think it might be an Australian book. In each book we also get like a little note um, from the Wild Book Box letting them know why they chose this book for us. And they selected this book because I said that I like Australian fiction, award-winning family and love. So I'm just checking Goodreads to get a bit of an idea of what we're in for. And it has a 4.16 out of 6,000 ratings. Meet Jimmy Flick. He's not like the other kids. He's both too fast and too slow. He sees too much and too little. Jimmy's mother Paula is the only one who can manage him. She teaches him how to count sheep so that he can fall asleep. She holds him tight enough to stop his cells spinning. It is only Paula who can keep Jimmy out of his father's way. But when Jimmy's world falls apart, he has to navigate the unfathomable world on his own and make things right. So it sounds like we've got a bit of family drama, a bit of difficulty with the father, um, and maybe a bit of a troubled kid in Jimmy. Now I think I know what this one is, but let's open it up. This is a copy of The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Now I asked the Wild Book Box to send me this when I saw it on their Instagram because I've never read anything by Toni Morrison. And obviously I'm aware this is a well-beloved book by a well-beloved author, so I was definitely keen to try. And all I know about this is that I think it's about a young black girl in America who wishes she had blue eyes. So I think from my very vague limited understanding this is going to be a story largely about race and maybe beauty as well and beauty constructs. Now for number three this is a chunky one. Ah I do know what this one is. They, they asked me if I already had this book and I said no so they sent it to me as well. And it is Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. Now I know this book has been a pretty big deal in the last year or so um, and I do have another book by this author I think it's called Blonde Roots that I am very keen to read but this one I am particularly interested in because it won the Booker Prize last year and I think from what I understand is that it's the first time the Booker Prize has been given to two people um, and um, Bernadine shared the prize with Margaret Atwood for The Testaments. And Margaret Atwood is one of my favourite authors ever, but I really didn't like The Testaments. Um, I didn't mind it as a standalone story, like if I tried to pretend it had nothing to do with The Handmaid's Tale, it didn't bother me so much. But as far as a, a, a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, I really, I don't think it's one of her best works. And I think it's disappointing that she won such a significant prize for that book and I think certainly there's some commentary to be made um, potentially about the fact that the first black woman to win this prize had to share it with a white woman um, for arguably not one of her best books. So I have been very very curious to read this um, and I just haven't gotten around to it. And this is a lovely hardback copy. Welcome to Britain and 12 very different people, mostly women, mostly black, who call it home. Teeming with life and crackling with energy, Girl, Woman, Other follows them across the miles and down the years. With vivid originality, irrepressible wit and sly wisdom, Bernadine Evaristo presents a gloriously new kind of history for this old country, ever dynamic, ever expanding and utterly irresistible. So I think this is probably the one I'm most excited about. Then I think number two would probably be The Bluest Eye. Uh, just because like I feel like Toni Morrison is someone everybody 
says you should read and I just never have. And then I am actually quite curious about this one and excited to read another Australian novel. I just don't know anything about it other than what we've just discovered together and I've never heard of it before. So these are the three books we will be reading together over the next month. I'm going to vlog my experience of them, let you know how I get along with each of these books and what I think of them. So let's just get stuck right in. Hello friends, I am 38 pages into The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Um, I don't know that I have a huge amount of thoughts to share with you but I thought we could just do a quick check-in. I think I mentioned earlier that this is my very first Toni Morrison book so I wasn't really sure what to expect going in other than just knowing that people love Toni Morrison. And so far I think I can, I'm starting to see why. The writing's so beautiful and there's sort of like turns of phrases and stuff that I've just are quite new to me. Um, like I've just not seen done in the same sort of way. Um, it's very easy to read though um, and I feel like these characters really come to life on the page. So far we've kind of been introduced to two different families um, and it really just feels like it's a story of race and class, class like poverty. And I don't know, but it just feels like there's a lot of sadness and hurt um, and maybe some internalized um, negative feelings and a bit of hatred. Like it's, it's a lot of really intense, unpleasant feelings. It's so far quite uncomfortable to read. I think sad. I think sad is how I feel reading this so far. It's not very long. It's like 180 pages. So quite a short book, but I don't think it's going to be one that I fly through. Um, it's not that I'm not enjoying it or finding it interesting, but it's sort of just one of those books that I feel like I need to take a bit of time with. Like it's not one that I want to read two or three hundred pages in a day. Do you know, I mean, there's not two or three hundred pages here, but you know what I mean. <laughs> like, it's sort of, I just want to read one chapter or sometimes even not even that much at a time and then put the book down and just let it mellow, I guess. I think that's partly because of the writing, but I think it's also just because there's a lot of, a lot of uncomfortable feelings. And so like allowing myself sp space just to kind of sit with those emotions and take them all in. Um, I don't know. I find that that can be a, like for me, a better way to read books that make me feel a little bit uncomfortable um, so I can really sit with those feelings rather than trying to avoid them um, and therefore have a more full experience of the book itself. Also, isn't this blue pretty? I did take the dust jacket off because it was getting in my way. And when I discovered this pretty blue underneath, I wasn't mad about it. I love it. I think so far it feels very harsh. Would that be the right word? Um, and I think that's very much like, a, like the people feel harsh. Um, and I think that's very much a consequence of their situation um, with so much poverty around them. Like there seems to be a need for a hardness um, in order to survive that's coming through in these characters. But I feel like the intersections of poverty and racism and sexism are really coming to a head in our main character, Pecola. Um, and it seems like this is going to be a story that has a lot to do with her own identity and experience of someone who is viewed as ugly and who is treated really poorly because of the way that she looks. Should be interesting. Um, I'm enjoying it so far, but I am taking my time with it. So I'll see you again maybe tomorrow or the next day. Hello friends. I am not in the mood to be on camera, uh, but I just wanted to check in because I've just finished The Blue Aside by Toni Morrison. I wasn't really sure how I was feeling about it. I was finding it quite difficult in a lot of ways, um, but it was actually the ending that kind of cemented this is a pretty powerful book for me in my mind. So many trigger warnings for all sorts of things, including um, incest and rape and just, just really awful stuff that a lot of the people um, in this community go through. And it's one of those books that mm, stuff happens, but it's it, it feels much more about the characters and the ideas that are being presented through these characters' experience rather than like, a particular plot if that makes sense and we skip between a few different um, points of view and we learn about uh, like the history and the experience of quite a lot of different characters so much of this book to me was about internalized racism um, and the hatred of self uh, that is fostered in environments like this and we really see that with Pecola with her like one deepest wish um, is that she can have blue eyes just like the pretty white girls um, and then um, when some really horrible stuff happens to her, the women in her community, you know, rather than showing solidarity, uh, they find all of the ways to blame her um, and to see her as like an inherently bad person as opposed to a child who is a victim of circumstance and a victim of so much oppression 
um, and abuse. So those are my initial thoughts on this one. I feel like it'll be a book I'll keep thinking about for the next little while, so I might have more to say later. But for now, I'm going to get stuck into The Eye of the Sheep by Sophie Laguna. This is an Australian novel from a few years ago. And uh, from what I can tell, I think it's about Jimmy, who's a young boy, um, and he maybe has a bit of a difficult family home life. And I think he's also neurodivergent in some way. I don't know if we'll learn specifically if he has a particular diagnosis or something in the book, but that's all I really know. Uh, so let's dive in, shall we? Hello, friends. I am checking in with you from bed today because I'm I'm just not having a great mental health day, so I've decided to spend the morning in bed because I can. But I thought I would update you on um, The Eye of the Sheep by Sophie Laguna. I am up to part three, um, which is about 87 pages in. And honestly, so far, I'm having very mixed feelings and mixed thoughts about this book. Um, it is basically the story of a young boy. His name's Jimmy, and at the beginning of the book, he's about six years old, I think, and he lives with his older brother and his mum and his dad. And he has some kind of learning disability. That's the sort of thing because I don't have any direct lived experience of it. I would like to like take the time to read some reviews and stuff of people who are more connected to that experience after I finished the book. I will say though so far that the writing is really, I really, really like it. And I really like the way that this young boy, Jimmy, he, in the writing, it's, it's presented really clearly that he sort of sees the world differently and he picks up on different things and just the way it's expressed with the sort of things he picks up on and why it's really interesting to read. What is less enjoyable to me is the way the mother has been presented and it just feels like the author really really wants us to know that she's fat and it feels like every single time the mother is mentioned in some way the size of her body manages to be inputted into the scene or the description. I've actually started flagging it because it was, it just felt like it was like every two pages, there was some reference in some way to her size. And it just, it's so, it feels so unnecessary. Like if a character had blue eyes and that was mentioned every two pages or like 15 times in the first 80 pages of a book, that would feel repetitive and pointless to most people. Um, and I feel like that's something that an editor would pick up on. And there was one part, if I'm being perfectly honest, that genuinely made me a little bit mad. Because a big part of this story is that Jimmy's father is really quite abusive um, to his mother. And usually he is abusive um, to his wife when he's drinking. And there's sort of this part of this book where, you know, he promises not to drink, but then a few weeks later, like, he inevitably ends up drinking. But it's kind of like how the mum tried Weight Watchers, but she just loves cake so much she can't keep away from it. And, like, she really should leave the husband, but he's just like a slice of cake. You know, she just can't say no to him. What? What? So I'm just getting tired of every single time, you know, the mother is mentioned. Somehow it's, like, her wide arms or her bulky thighs or, like, just, or she's as big as a bed or as wide as a door frame. Like... It's just, it's not necessary. Even when she hops into bed to soothe Jimmy because he has trouble falling asleep. Um, she got in bed beside me. I had to move over to the far edge so that I was pressed up against the wall to make room for her. Mum was as wide as my bed. Mum ran at me. The bulk of her legs and back and bottom held me tight. It was only the mountain of her that was big and strong enough to contain me. She looked like a big cake that wasn't cooked or ready for the world. Her fists looked small and white under the shed light where the moths gathered and clung. Her body was wider than the whole door frame, but her knock was soft and timid. I could see how much she wanted to be in the shed with Dad. She would have stretched out and been the bed for him if he'd let her. She was the same size. And it is honestly getting to the point now where it's taking me out of the story because it's just like, especially the last chapter, it's every two or three pages, there's some mention of her being fat. And it's just, it's so unnecessary and just so repetitive. Like no other character trait of any of the other characters is consistently kind of put on the page like this. Like, I'm not sure I even know what hair color she has or eye color she has or really what, like, I don't know any of these distinctive features about any of the other characters. The older son is really tall. That's only been mentioned once. It's not mentioned every time he walks in the room. Like, it just, this fixation on her weight is just, it's really off-putting to me. Um, and it's really taken me out of the story. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. 
Like I really like the writing and the the narration of our protagonist Jimmy is really unique and interesting. But there's also just some things that are just kind of shitting me off at the moment. So I don't know. Hello friends. I have been terrible at vlogging this past week, but I'm here to set the record straight and let you know what I thought of our three books this month. So I've already spoken quite a bit about The Blue Eye by Toni Morrison. I really liked it. I keep saying I liked it. I didn't like it. It was miserable. <laughs> but I very much appreciated it and I thought, I, I felt that it delivered a very powerful story in a very poignant, moving way. Next was, of course, The Eye of the Sheep by Sophie Laguna. And I know I updated you when I was about 80 pages in and that I was struggling. Well, the struggle didn't get any easier, let me say that. Now this book, I counted 27 references to Paula, um, Jimmy's mother's weight or her body size. 20, I flagged them, 20, two on one page. Did you see that? And to make matters worse, I'm gonna get into spoilers here. She dies halfway through the book. And even as she was dying, she died of an asthma attack. There was nothing I could do but be her little man, watching as she tried and tried. Then she closed her eyes and her body, so big and wide, arched like a bridge. It was just constant through this book and to the point where it was really repetitive and totally unnecessary. Like, no other character trait of any character is referenced more than two or three times, let alone 27. Also, I'm starting to notice like a theme in a lot of Australian books that I'm reading lately and I'm kind of a bit frustrated by it. And that is that there's just so many Australian books that I've been reading that are narrated by young children who have a difficult home life where their fathers are very abusive and often the mother dies. Like I understand that these things are important to talk about um, and that this is kind of like a, a not uncommon experience that people have, but I just feel like the focus on it in so many Australian novels and celebrated Australian novels, I don't know, it's just making me wonder about like the mythology of Australia and the sort of stories that we tell ourselves about who we are um, and the sort of stories that we feel are important to tell and why. How familial abuse just seems to be one of the most common threads in so many Australian novels. And then the other common thread is that women die. Um, a lot of women are just dying. Women are dying everywhere. So it's got me thinking. I don't have any like solid conclusions to offer you, but it's something that I'm thinking about and that I'm noticing. In a lot of ways, this is a pretty slow novel. Um, like the first good half of the book really is just about Jimmy's home life and his experience being a bit different um, in how he sees the world and how he understands the world. And the father, as I've mentioned, is physically abusive, mostly towards the mother. At one point in the book though, um, Jimmy kind of walks in on them having an altercation uh, and the father does strike Jimmy um, and he hurts him pretty badly although he is okay um, but I think his own guilt and kind of realization of what he's done where he's okay hitting his wife but he's not okay hitting his son um, so he basically runs off and disappears. So Paula and Jimmy are left on their own um, and Paula ends up having an asthma attack and dying um, and Jimmy basically like stays in her bed for four days next to her and eventually like the authorities find them. Jimmy is then sent off to live with his uncle up in Queensland, I think it was. Um, but his uncle kind of, you know, he never had children out of his own and he doesn't quite know how to handle Jimmy and he has to work and all of that. So Jimmy ends up going into a foster home. So I don't, I don't love this story in terms of like the direction it took. It didn't feel like particularly new to me. Nothing about this book to me stood out. The most significant thing was the writing and the way that um, Jimmy's narration uh, was presented and how his neurodiversity, um, whatever label that would receive, I'm not sure, um, it, does, it makes him see the world in a slightly different way. Like when he's talking about people crying, he's, he describes it as their pipes leaking, stuff like that. And he just, he does get overstimulated very quickly and easily. Certain things kind of set him off. So it was Jimmy himself and his narration that was the most interesting thing about the book. The rest of it, I didn't really find very engaging and clearly there was quite a lot of things that I found frustrating by it. As I said, I don't have an experience of neurodiversity in the way that Jimmy sort of is presented as having. So I don't want to comment on how appropriate or accurate that itself was. Um, I think, uh, as I said, I would like to kind of read some more reviews and stuff and get a sense of what other people feel um, about that representation. But those are my thoughts on this book. I, did, I didn't really enjoy it. And the book that I did not vlog at all because I'm a terrible vlogger, I'm very sorry. And also just because I was so immersed, I did not put this book down 
all weekend. Um, I have mentioned before that I'm a pretty slow reader um, in terms of like how many pages I get through at a time. Um, and this is a 450 page book and I read it in like two and a bit days. So I really, all I did this weekend was read. I couldn't put it down. I really, really loved this. This is kind of more like a series of short stories that are interconnected than it is a novel in like the classic sense. Essentially we get 12 chapters um, and each follows a different character. We don't really even get like a plot for each of these characters so much. It's more like a, a character profile or something for each of them where we sort of span quite a big chunk of their life for most of them. Um, sort of get a sense of like who they are and why I guess. Like what sort of things happened to them in childhood um, that made them who they are. I will say that sometimes like the woke language felt a little burdensome to the book and to the characters. Sometimes it felt a little bit like, uh, I don't know, we were sort of covering as much ground and as many topics as we could. Um, and each of the characters you could really see sort of facilitated a partic particular discussion. Also, this whole book, it doesn't really have like a plot that's driving it. We really are just getting to know these characters. And I know that's something that not everybody will love. I, however, was enthralled. I could not put this down. I fell in love with each and every character in their own way. Obviously, many of them were flawed, but I, I sunk into them and their experience and I sympathized and empathized with them. Whether or not I agreed with them didn't matter. They felt like real people. And I really enjoyed the writing. Obviously it took me a moment to kind of settle into it because its form is a little bit different. Um, it sort of reads almost like poetry, but with longer sentences, because uh, there aren't really capitalizations at the beginning of sentences. Proper nouns are capitalized, but not the beginning of sentences. And rather than having full stops, we just have a line break. And those line breaks I found were used really effectively um, to kind of really punctuate um, the story and also gave rhythm in some parts of the story too. Clearly when you open this book the writing's a bit different, the style's a bit different, but for me I found it really like added to my experience of it and it sort of allowed I think the author to be a bit more free with jumping between characters, jumping between time periods, jumping between thoughts and dialogue. I don't know, it just felt fluid in a way that I feel like if proper punctuation and grammar had been used might not have been as easily accessible. So basically this is a book about 12 different people, most of them black, most of them women, as the blurb says. And we just get to know them and through getting to know them we um, learn about their interconnections. Some of them are like best friends um, and others have more sort of um, distant connections, but they are all interconnected. And what I loved about this is just how we got such a great view of how all of these people had done their best. <laughs> is sort of like the feeling I got, like they'd all been given different circumstances and they'd all done their best with what they had. I also really loved how we got a lot of intergenerational relationships as well. Like right off the bat, um, two of the first characters we meet are Amma and Yaz, and Amma is Yaz's mum. And Amma was like this super radical lesbian feminist in like the 70s and stuff. And she was super anti-establishment and like really pretty revolutionary in a lot of ways. And yet Yaz, like modern day Yaz, kind of sees her mom as like, you know, a bit establishment and not as radical as Amma sees herself. Especially around things like gender, um, where Amma and her friends were kind of what we would call TERFs today, I think, in a lot of ways. Yaz is much more aware of like the trans experience um, and she even believes that in the future gender won't exist. Um, so she kind of thinks that her mum and her mum's friends ideology around that like gender um, and womanhood is too strict. So that is one very obvious explicit example of this intergenerational difference and different ways of perceiving the world and different ideas of what progressive means. Some other really big themes were certainly class and then the immigrant experience as well, especially um, some of the older generations mostly. We get um, examples of people having moved from different parts of Africa, different parts of the world to Britain for different reasons. And I love how we see their experience of being immigrants, sort of what they hoped for um, and and then how those expectations were and were not met. Um, but then later on we'll get a chapter from one of their children or one of their grandchildren um, about their own experience of having to navigate their own sense of identity in Britain. There were some weird bits like there is a point at which a mother basically falls in lust with her son-in-law and that shit gets freaky. I don't know. So there were some bits in here that I didn't love or just felt a little bit off, but there was so much of it that I loved and that like I just couldn't put this book down and I was so engaged with each and every one of these people. And I think how quickly I got through this 
is really a testament to how engaging all of these characters were because there wasn't a plot that was driving it all that kept me coming back wanting to know what happened. It really was just being enthralled and engaged with each and every one of these characters and just feeling like they were so alive on the page. So I don't know if this is a four and a half or a five star. I obviously do have some criticisms of it or I can see where um, maybe it wasn't as successful as you know, like I would like it to be or I can appreciate where some people might you know, I think um, legitimately criticize the book. I, I can appreciate those. Uh, but at the end of the day, the reading experience of this was amazing. I really loved it. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, I did give um, The Bluest Eye four stars. So my favorite was Girl, Woman, Other. I really also liked um, The Bluest Eye. And then this was a generous two stars. <laughs> but overall, I'm just having so much fun with this service. And even when I don't enjoy a book, I'm still like enjoying the process of trying something that I wouldn't have picked up for myself otherwise. I'm sorry I wasn't great at vlogging this week, especially for Girl, Woman, Other. I hope you can forgive me. I'll try and be a little bit more diligent about that for our next box next month. I would love to in the comments below if you have read any of these books what you think of them and as always I have to say a big thank you to my patrons over on patreon for all of your support I really appreciate it and a big extra special thank you goes to Tracy Timmerman, Laurie, Lynette Brown and the Hales K. Thank you all so much for your support but I think that's all I have for you for this vlog I hope you enjoyed hanging out with me this month and talking books I will see you again in next week's video and until then so much love bye <laughs>